Just want to say welcome to all you early attendees. I definitely appreciate you being prepared. We are going to spend a couple minutes here waiting for everybody to get logged in. So just sit tight, but thanks for uh, being with us. I'm sure everybody is dealing with uh, this new normal that we have. I go ahead and get that term out of the way early. I was uh, pleased to be able to uh, wear the shirt that I got for Christmas. It's uh, sat pretty lonely in my closet since then. Not really much use for it working from home. Although I did realize that, you know, I only have to iron the front of it, which saved me a good couple minutes. Uh, yeah, to everybody logging on, thanks again for joining. We're going to wait a couple minutes. I think everybody knows that there are always those people that are unable to log in right away. Um, so before I intro my guest here and our topic, I'm just going to give a couple minutes so everybody can make sure to get on, get settled, get your coffee. I know uh, we got people joining from all over the world, so uh, some of you will uh, certainly probably be on to maybe a, a harder drink than coffee, although if you're European, you're probably still, still taking uh, espresso shots. I know that it's probably been an adjustment for everybody. I see that a lot of the attendees here are building managers and uh, in the building industry. I know it's been a hard time for a lot of you. So hopefully this will be able to kind of, uh, you know, help you understand what's, what's ahead. You know, every day I feel like we do get a little bit more clarity on uh, what the future might look like. But I think um, if these last few months have taught us anything, it's that, you know, it's hard to get our hopes uh, too high because things, certainly seem to be able to change very quickly. So uh, I personally um, had been working from home before and I'm doing so now, but I, I definitely uh, feel for, for all of you that uh, have had to make the switch. And, you know, I know there uh, are a lot of people that, you know, still do have to go into work. And so I, I really want to just thank all of them. I know it's a, it's a hard thing to do now with all the, the danger lurking out there, but, um, there's definitely a lot of a lot of needed work in my mind. People that keep buildings running are definitely uh, essential frontline workers. So so thank you to all of you. I see we got a lot more people jumping on. Uh, we're going to wait a little bit more just to make sure we get those last few participants in that want to join and watch. But thanks again for joining. I think it's going to be a a really great, a really great webinar. We're going to have uh, some really in-depth conversations about uh, the way to to use data, and you know, I think there's a lot of details around that. I think a lot of a lot of people really try to gloss over it, and you know, it's easy to say um, use data to inform things, but when you really sit down and try to do it, uh, it's obviously not always as easy. So. Um, if any of you have questions, there is a, uh, a question button on the bottom. We'll have a couple minutes at the end here. And um, yeah, I, I will be very happy to, to pose those. We've already gotten a couple emailed questions beforehand. So thank you for those. And um, I see we've got already a couple uh, people in the chat from, from different places. From, so it's really nice to be able to have these kind of platforms to have, have this global audience. So. Just wait a couple more minutes here while we, while we fill out and people are able to, to file in, find their seats. Luckily, we're automatically socially distanced with uh, being at home. Um, I don't know about you, I definitely miss uh, you know, speaking on, on a stage and, and doing this at events, but uh, I think that this is a, a great format too. I think it, it really is able to bring uh, this content to a lot of people that probably wouldn't have any other ways, right? And so, um, whereas I think that we do miss a little bit of the, the connection you get from, from meeting at events, um, I think these are a, a, maybe a, a way to maybe cast a wider net with some of this information. So uh, definitely a silver lining there. All right, so we hit our, our two minute mark. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and get started here. Thank you everyone for joining. Okay, welcome to today's PropMoto webinar. Uh, before I intro the speaker, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what we'll be talking about today. You know, I know that um, 
a lot of our readers uh, at top of their mind right now is, is really how, how to bring people back to buildings and how to make them feel safe and how to keep them safe. And so uh, it was really important for us to, to try to put together some uh, you know, content around how to do that and how to best do that. I think everybody has kind of uh, understanding that there's a change in how we're going to um, do some of our do some of our cleaning and do some of our procedures, but the, the details of that are, are sometimes murky and, and hard to understand. So to help us understand that, uh, I've brought uh, Tom Jackson here on. Hi, Tom. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. So Tom is a COO and a chief strategy officer for MicroShare. MicroShare is a really great company that provides uh, sensing as a service and digital twin um, to, to a lot of large companies um, all over the board, right? They do commercial real estate, uh, healthcare, manufacturing, and um, you know those are obviously those last two are industries that have been working pretty much the same or overtime uh, now. So I think the learnings that he got from that uh, will really help a lot of uh, our listeners hopefully understand, you know how how to bring that into our our new world of of building management as we go along. So uh, Tom, if you could maybe just give a, uh, everybody a quick idea of your background, and then we can uh, get into some of these details. Sure. Um uh, my extended background is uh, basically as a financial officer of, uh, of a public company uh, years ago. Uh, but more recently, I've focused most of my energies on uh, technology, process, and, and people. And, and so most recently with uh, MicroShare, we're about a seven-year-old company. And uh, we pivoted to the IoT space about four years ago and have focused uh, in that space and developing solutions and platforms uh, for, the, uh, for the industries you mentioned a few minutes ago. Great. So, you know, I think everyone is kind of understanding that anything we knew before, the, the, the old playbook we're kind of throwing out, right? And, and we're rewriting the new one as we go along. And so maybe, you know, you can kind of uh, set this up with, uh, with explaining a little bit about how we have done things traditionally. And I think that might um, help explain, you know, the kind of leap that we're about to take and, and how hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, to rise to these challenges. Sure. So uh, one of the things to be clear at the outset is that we're, we're gonna be talking about, uh, not specifically about how we clean, but about how we utilize the resources for cleaning. So there are plenty of experts and, and scientists that are doing work uh, related specifically to how to actually do the cleaning. But our focus today is using data and how we can use that to manage uh, the cleaning resources. So one of the fundamental changes that has happened literally over the, the last uh, four months or so is that the, the, the work that needs to be done by the cleaning staff uh, has shifted fairly dramatically. Uh, much more focus on high touch space and on high density uh, locations. And uh, when you think about the general way that uh, cleaning staff is allocated, uh, that hasn't really been a focus uh, for the cleaning staff. They basically have, have done more so uh, cleaning in the evening, cleaning in off hours, and, uh, and with uh, COVID, the requirement has really been to have them be more present, more visible, and cleaning those high uh, visibility uh, and high touch spaces. So that's uh, a big change in, in the way that resources were utilized. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about like, you know, how, how to make cleaning the most impactful, right? And it's really interesting because I think as everything has come out, we've learned a lot more about the virus and, and ways to actually clean. But I think you, know, you bring up a good point about you know one of the uh, the real reasons that we are making sure to clean is to, to make sure to get people's trust that they will come back right and so I think that's an important impact is to uh, really display the fact that things are sanitary to build this kind of trust so people feel um, you know better about about coming back but you know maybe you can kind of uh, explain a little bit about how you think that the 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 way that um, you know we understand the the allocation of resources uh, is is changing a little bit again. This is something that you know 
buildings are often looking at maybe having to get more cleaning staff. So I think it's even uh, a heightened awareness right now of like, okay, let's make sure every one of our dollar counts. And so, you know, what have you noticed so far about uh, how that's kind of changing the way people are thinking? So um, historically people have uh, had resources allocated uh, largely based on fixed schedules and on with a spatial orientation. In other words, how many, how many square footage of, how much square footage of space do we need to cover? And, uh, and this, this recent change that has happened with COVID has, has shifted uh, to having more resources available at different times during uh, the day than, than was historically the case. So, so that, that change has really put people, uh, companies want to be in a place where they provide a safe environment for their employees and can, and, and, and can gather that trust from employees that's required once people are in the building. It's a whole other world with people getting to, to their location uh, and being safe. But once they're in the building, you want to be sure that, that things are being cleaned routinely. So that has fundamentally changed uh, a lot of that shift work uh, that, that used to take place in the evening, there's a greater pres a need for presence during the day and then a reallocation during the day and a more frequent cleaning during the day uh, and wanting to make sure that you get the right resources to the right locations at the right time. And it, it historically has been hard to, to gather that kind of information uh, that wasn't generally available, it wasn't widely available. Yeah, I feel like the problem has been compounded also by the kind of changing nature of work. I think uh, we're all starting to understand that as offices come back, we will likely see them, you know, maybe open longer hours, right? People will be given the ability to come in or not. So, you know, I think before we had a very, um, you know, uh, understandable kind of, here's when the people are going to come, right? Nine to five, it was, you know, your, your inflow and your outflow was, was very easy to to predict now, you know, that's a big unknown, right? And so that I think is something that I'm sure is, is top of mind for you as you're kind of thinking about the future. Yeah, in, in fact, you know, that gets represented in the way that people are assembling their return to work plans. Uh, so those plans, they, they vary by, uh, by location uh, because spatial distancing requirements will vary by location. And historically, uh, most people, uh, don't really know this, but generally, uh, space utilization in offices has been anywhere. I mean, we s staff from a cleaning perspective for for eighty to one hundred percent, but the general utilization is in the sixty sixty five percent range, and frequently less than that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the or the historical orientation has to be has been to clean based on that much higher level of utilization of space. Um, and, and that is now shifting with these return to work plans. And so that's one of the reasons why we've, we've put together an assessment tool that helps people understand uh, how they may want to think about this going forward. Um, because with, with staffing levels coming back in, sometimes staged at a much lower level, uh, that provides them with not the same kind of requirement for cleaning uh, of the used space. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that. as we Yeah. And I, I really like this, this uh, assessment tool that you've made because, you know, I think it's really easy for companies to kind of tell building operators like, Oh, we'll just go ahead and just install a bunch of technology and spend a bunch of money. And then you'll be much better at this. And, you know, I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that especially now, right, budgets are constrained and there isn't, uh, I think, there always needs to be kind of a low tech solution. And so in, in my mind, this, this is that, right? This is a way people can really just understand uh, based on the knowledge they have now, even if they have, you know, no technology in place, how to better optimize their cleaning. So maybe kind of go into to the questions and how you um, organize the thoughts. Sure. So uh, as we were talking with, uh, with various clients and, and pr prospects, actually, they were telling us that they know that, that the, the problem that they have is they know that they have certain space that needs to be cleaned. And historically, based on their uh, historical reference point uh, pre-COVID, um, and they know that 
there is uh, new requirements for high touch uh, and high visibility cleaning. Um, but, but they're not exactly sure uh, whether they have capacity now be because they were thinking that that incremental cleaning they needed to do would need to be done on top of the existing work that they were doing previously. And so our, our tool asks uh, five basic questions of people about their uh, about the type of cleaning they have, uh, the, the amount of staff they have, the amount of square footage they have to be cleaned. And then we ask uh, what their assessment is for the total amount of incremental cleaning that's required. Uh, and then based on that, uh, we, we have an opportunity to find out um, what their excess capacity is because we're in a position to look at pre-COVID cleaning requirements, current cleaning requirements, which have been reduced some because of the uh, amount of people that are, are being brought back to work over time. And, and then we can come up with a capa excess capacity uh, that allows them to make sure that they have the resources uh, to do, do the current cleaning requirement. And you'd mentioned before, uh, Franco, and it's very important that this is not going to be static, right? The return to work plan is a is an evolving thing, uh, and as people have have begun to think about what what their staffing levels look like as they return, uh, you need to take that into account as you think about what space to clean and what not to clean, and and that's. Uh, part of what our tool allows you to, to kind of make an estimate of is what incremental cleaning do we need to do? What basic cleaning do we need to do that we had historically done based on usage and uh, estimated usage, in this case, the return to work plan? And then do we have enough capacity to do that? And the, and the basic answer is uh, in most cases, people do have the capacity to do it, uh, but it requires that they think a little bit differently about the way they clean. Yeah, and it's this thinking differently that I, I really, um, you know, took to heart when, when I was studying this. I think, you know, how much cleaning you do, cleaning kind of seems like a thing that's hard to quantify, right? Because it, it doesn't really have like a, like a completion point, you know, it's always needing to be done. But I think bringing things into this kind of framework can start to build this um, quantification of, of the cleaning that I think then you can start to understand how it can be optimize a lot better, right? Because once you, you know, build a model like this, I think you start to see the blind spots, right? And so, you know, maybe you can kind of talk to that about, I think this is a kind of a great assessment, but um, certainly there, there are some places that they could probably use a little bit more nuanced uh, details when it comes to the data. Yeah, so, um, so the, the blind spots really represent those spaces that aren't being used uh, and and if resources are being allocated to clean spaces, to inspect spaces and clean spaces that uh, haven't been used, that's not really a great utilization or allocation of those resources. So, so what, what we've done with our, our tool here that we'd like to make available to people and, and share and engage with them is, is to come up with a quick assessment, a way of determining whether based on the answers to a few questions, whether we think that they have adequate capacity and, and then really engage in a dialogue uh, which, which the assessment leads to, which is, well, okay, I may have capacity, but then how do I use the resources? Where do I do the cleaning? And it's hard to answer that question without having uh, more detailed data. Mm -hmm. and, and that data that, that, that we talk with people about is by making available uh, motion sensors and other uh, sensors that are available through uh, through our various solutions that allow you to understand the amount of space of traffic that takes place in a given space, what the the uh, space utilization of that is on a percentage basis, and and if it's low or no uh, no utilization or low utilization that space doesn't need to be cleaned the same way that a heavy space might be used. And, and if you think about restrooms or conference rooms as, as a reference point for that, 
it, it's helpful. Thinking about a single office or a workstation itself, uh, uh, that's a little bit different. But when we think about those spaces where you have multiple people using the space, um, the less the space is used, uh, the, the less uh, overall effort is required to maintain that space. Mm -hmm. and, and so our data allows for that to be captured with uh, sensors. And, and through this model, then we, we've looked at a couple of different scenarios that we, uh, we think makes sense to, uh, for people to consider. Uh, one is, is kind of a, what we think of as a normal return to work uh, uh, plan. And, and that normal work to, uh, return to work plan, you can think about 20 to 30% perhaps for the first two months of return to work of your employees coming back uh, into the office. Um, and then over the two months following that, it, that number might go from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50%. But it's not going to be at, a, at what we used to think of as 100% return to work. So if you average that number out uh, and you then compare that to the amount of incremental cleaning space that, uh, excuse me, cleaning that's required for COVID, the sum of that uh, kind of routine cleaning, but at a lower level of utilization, along with the new incremental cleaning, uh, that, that typically will only represent maybe 60 or 70% of what the level of cleaning was before. Uh, if, and we've, we've then looked at the assessment and we said, well, maybe we shouldn't just look, think about a normal return to work what happens if there's a very aggressive return to work where, where a uh, location you know, around the country hasn't had the same kind of experience that some of the hotspots have had? So what if that location would, would have a overall average return to work over the, a six month period of about 70%? How would that then relate to the incremental work that's re uh, the incremental uh, COVID related cleaning that's required? And, and so we call that the aggressive return to work plan. And under that scenario, in, in most cases that we look at, it still looks like there is uh, some capacity that's available related to pre-COVID cleaning estimates uh, in terms of total hours that uh, people, that organizations spent pre-COVID and what is required now. Um, the th third scenario that I'd like to share is one where we have a high demand a hospital situation where the hospital doesn't didn't close down uh, as most businesses did. They remained uh, up and running. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, they had to do additional cleaning, uh, COVID cleaning. So, so how did they fare in, in this situation? Uh, and the answer is, uh, by being able to monitor space uh, that isn't being used, uh, in many cases, there is excess capacity uh, for those spaces that aren't being used, and that excess capacity in terms of resources then can be applied to the incremental COVID-related re cleaning. So, and, and we, have a, we have an additional um, slide that kind of shows how, how we use tools to do that that we'll get to in a few minutes. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, I, what was really great thinking about this was, you know, almost kind of borrowing from the financial world, right? It's that you, you can't predict the future, but when you build a model, you, you can run simulations and you can stress test. And I'm sure, you know, it uh, would be really nice for a lot of building managers to know, okay, even if we do kind of hit this, you know, what might seem now like an aggressive, you know, return to work schedule, we probably still will have capacity with, with what we have. Right. And so it's that kind of thinking that I think is so important to start to, you know, put things into a framework, look at your different, um, you know, your different options and how to be prepared for them. Because again, we, none of us really know as much as some people try to, to predict it's, it's really, really hard. Right. And so um, is that what you've seen uh, your clients doing is kind of trying to run any possible scenario through this? Yeah, uh, because you're right. No one really knows. And, and this is really, we see this happening day to day right now, we see it happening, uh, particularly with regard to return to school. Uh, 
Mm. So many of our clients are, you know, operate in, in higher education. And, and so they're dealing right now with how, how, how do we bring the students back? And, you know, 60 days ago, there were schools were being, were pretty clear about, about, you know, return to school. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, within the last week or so, because of the way the numbers have changed over the last uh, month or so, uh, in, in terms of uh, COVID-related cases, that uh, universities are changing their mind about how they're going to, to handle this uh, with, with a much stronger bias towards on online classes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's changing real time. And I, you know, historically with, with cleaning, th th there were variances that took place day to day and season to season, you know, Generally, there was less activity, for example, in the July and August timeframe for, uh, at least in the, the U.S. related to vacation schedules and whatnot. Um, and, and seasonality ar around holiday seasons, you'd see a dip in, in traffic. But in most cases, while there might have been modest changes that were made in terms of the utilization of cleaning resources, uh, the, the changes weren't dramatic. Uh, but... but with what's happened now with uh, the COVID situation, the changes are dramatic, and and the, and the volatility is going to continue. Uh, so, I, I don't think anyone can feel comfortable right now suggesting that they have a crystal ball to say what things are going to look like in October, what things are going to look like in January, and what things are going to look like next April. We we just don't know. And so the better able you are to be flexible uh, and be responsive with the way you deploy your resources, uh, the, the better you're going to be able to maintain that trust with both your employees and your, and your customers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, you know, that the higher education uh, brings up a good point of, you know, not only is it very hard to kind of benchmark this kind of a thing because all buildings are different, but also all use cases are very different, right? You know, I think higher education, it's kind of a binary thing. It's like they either have to announce classes they're going to start or they're not. Whereas, you know, some buildings might need to have a small, uh, you know, skeleton staff on hand. Others, you know, might be able to kind of have the more dimmer switch approach as, you know, has, has been said where, you know, they might, might bring some people back, we dial them back. Right. So, so really as much as, um, you know, as much as it would be nice to kind of be able to just take some guidelines, right, you know, kind of uh, there's plenty of organizations that I'm sure would love to give them. I think at the end of the day, you really have to just understand your own space and your own use. And, you know, so obviously to take that a step further, right, where we're going with this is, you know, how do we do that? How do we better understand our spaces to, to do that? So maybe you can kind of jump in and, and talk about some of the technology out there that, that can be used. Yeah, so... Um... So we've worked closely with uh, facility management companies, for example, as well as uh, uh, tenants uh, and in, in the um, manufacturing and factory setting uh, with a variety of our solutions, um, including contact tracing as well as uh, occupancy monitoring. Uh, and, and we use occupancy monitoring as a way to drive predictive cleaning. Uh, there are six core solutions that are part of what we make available to clients. Uh, but specifically the ones that were the one that we're using this assessment tool related to is predictive cleaning. And um, we, we use sensors to monitor space utilization. We uh, monitor specifically the traffic and the utilization of that space. And we develop a utilization score that allows us to determine how much an individual space or a cluster of spaces, workstations are used. And then based on that, uh, as you can see here, and I'll go into more detail about this in a second, we then kind of rank order these, the amount uh, based on a utilization score, the amount of uh, space that needs to be cleaned. What you can see in this, uh, this hospital use case, which I referred to a few minutes ago, the graphic on the uh, on the right that shows the bar graphs, that that is looking at uh, individual uh, periods of time uh, over the last several months, over the last uh, five months or so, and the red bars there represent the amount of 
uh, space that has not been used at all. So you see uh, just to the right of the uh, iPhone there, uh, a March period where the red bar and the uh, orange bar kind of accelerates up and, and then it, it dips down a little bit. And so in, in this case of the hospital, uh, they, the hospital began to curtail the amount of visitors that were permitted to come into the hospital. Uh, both third parties uh, that service the hospital, as well as, uh, for example, florist services and uh, and other third party providers, as well as uh, uh, the family members of, uh, of, of patients within the hospital. So, so what ended up happening was there was a, a spike in terms of the amount of uh, non-used, if you will, space. Uh, in this case, it was restrooms. Uh, and, and so the, the normal response, uh, the, generally the cl cleaning folks don't really know about that spike or not spike. They clean all of the restrooms accordingly. Uh, and, and so in this case, we were able to drill down beneath the surface there, take a look at what was really happening uh, across a whole range of, uh, of spaces. In this case, there were 23 spaces that we were looking at. And it turned out that uh, of those 23 spaces, 17 uh, really experienced uh, almost no traffic, but six of them experienced the same level or a little bit more traffic be because they were in, in public areas and they were near cafeterias and those were spaces that people were using. Uh, at the time, the, the cleaning staff was not adjusting the way that they were cleaning to take that into account. So they were, as, as I mentioned earlier, they, people are inclined to use all, uh, clean all of the spaces the same way. Uh, and they, uh, at the time, didn't adjust the resources. So once we were able to share with them the way the space was being used, they said, geez, we, we need to reallocate the way that we're using our resources by having this excess uh, capacity, if you will. Now we can take those resources that we were having, spend time cleaning uh, and doing all of the tasks that need, that generally were required in a normal scenario. Now we can take those resources and we can place them uh, to, uh, to, to focus on these high touch areas that need to be cleaned. Uh, and restrooms that need to be cleaned more frequently. So rather than cleaning twice a day, maybe now we'll clean three or four times a day. And, and so that means better, uh, better service. It means uh, safer service surfaces for people. Uh, and, and it's a level of dynamic management of resources and space that really isn't, isn't uh, typical. Yeah, I think, you know, that brings up a great point about the kind of the nuance of, of space use, right? It's just saying, oh, we have less occupancy doesn't mean that every space will have less occupancy, right? That's a great example in the hospital. Well, you know, you, you take a lot of the bathrooms away, some of the other bathrooms might get, get higher traffic, right? And so, um, and I think people are probably going to see that in the office too, right? I think we're going to see a lot of spaces, um, you know, conference rooms, I'm thinking, for example, right, they might not be used as much, whereas, you know, we might start to see kind of private heads down booths getting quite, quite a bit more, um, more usage. So for me, I, I really like this too, because I'm a bit of a visual thinker. And I think, you know, the, the way that you've been able to kind of lay, lay things out over this to see, um, you know, to, to see it is, is really helpful for me. So uh, you know, I think everybody kind of understands the importance of, of probably uh, investing um, in, in technology, particularly in hardware. But I know that when you sit down to actually do this, it, it, there's a lot of details, right, that need to get hammered out. So, you know, maybe talk if people are really sitting down with their shopping list right now and trying to understand what to buy, maybe give, give some tips on uh, some buying tips on, on how to do that. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we as a company have tried to do is we, we've tried to make that process much easier for clients. Um, you know, two or three years ago, um, if you wanted to put together a solution like this, it, it required 
quite a bit of effort by an individual company. You, you had to source the sensors. You had to first figure out what sensors made sense, what was possible. You, you then had to source the sensors. You had to figure out how to receive, receive the data from the sensors and then how to move that into some kind of uh, platform where you could actually translate it into something that was understandable. Uh, and, and then you had to maybe do some, create some visualizations of that and some analytics of that. So all that whole stream of work that was required was difficult for someone to do. So we've tried to eliminate all of that for clients. Uh, we've, we participate in a, um, in a group called the LoRa Alliance. Uh, LoRa is a communication standard, a way that sensors speak to gateways and connect to the cloud. And there are 500 or so members that are part of the LoRa Alliance. It's part of a large ecosystem of providers, uh, manufacturers and providers that, that deliver uh, sensor solutions uh, to the marketplace. And so uh, we, we've been an active member of that group for uh, four years now, have been uh, and, and work very closely with manufacturers. Uh, and those manufacturers are coming up with new solutions all the time. So the combination of this alliance along with uh, a communication standard from a customer point of view, it puts the customer in a position where they can buy, they can feel comfortable buying sensors today and solutions today, but recognizing that the infrastructure that they've put in place actually provides them with a path to the future. And so they don't, they, they're not going to find themselves in a position where they've thrown money away, get, you know, getting one solution, and then they have to get a new solution. And that's a whole different infrastructure. Our platform uh, and the standards that are being followed allow them to kind of future proof that uh, investment. Yeah, and I think that will give a lot of people peace of mind. Um, you know, I know it's always hard to kind of pull the trigger on a tech investment, not knowing, you know, for how long it's going to be, you know, pay dividends. But that's obviously even more, uh, you know, heightened right now. I think budgets are constrained, and so, um, you know, I think that's a it's a, a really big thing to to be able to to know to have the the knowledge of okay, as long as we kind of keep all of our sensors on this one um, communication platform you know, we can plug and play and, and that, that really helps there. Um, I'd like to now kind of jump into maybe some of the, the things that can be done, right? If, if um, you know, someone wants to spend the money to invest in some of this uh, data capture and sensing technology, what will that allow them to do as far as uh, understanding and optimizing their cleaning? Yeah, so um, we're, we're, we have uh, layered on top of the basic hardware solution here uh, both da dashboards that are available out of the date, uh, out of the gate, as well as um, business intelligence platform that al allows for the, the kind of uh, visuals that we were just looking at a moment ago. Um, so, so what that what that does is it allows people to basically uncover the hidden, as we were describing a few minutes ago, the the areas of space that are not being used. And by, by being able to look at all of your spaces and those ones that aren't being used, you can then allocate your resources to the areas that need to be cleaned and not, uh, and not be worrying about the space that, that hasn't been used and doesn't really require cleaning or where you can uh, calibrate the amount of cleaning uh, that is required. Uh, you know, typically the way that cleaning has been determined is um, with fixed, uh, a fixed uh, group of people or resources doing fixed tasks on a fixed amount of spaces. And, and we're beginning, you know, through the, by having the data tools available, we're able to identify specific areas that, oh, bless you, that, uh, that aren't, uh, aren't being used, so they don't require that cleaning, and other areas where there is less cleaning, uh, less usage, and therefore fewer tasks, if you will, that need to be done. And all of that makes available um, uh, resources that can be used 
to improve service or to do more frequent cleaning the way we were talking about before. Uh, we, we, I'd mentioned a few minutes ago that we work with uh, facility management companies and we do that around the world. Um, one of our larger clients is a, is a firm called, named Aramark and we've worked very closely with them uh, actually monitoring a wide range of spaces both in Europe and, and in the States and in multiple industries. And, and they're, at the in, they're at the innovation edge of things leading this to try to understand what the impact of that can be on their, uh, on, on how they can provide better service, safer service, uh, and upgrade what it is that they're doing with their cleaning clients. Yeah, you know, and going back to our kind of conversation earlier about, uh, you know, really building trust, I think a fascinating part of this, obviously, you know, facilities managers, office managers, like there is a very obvious need for them to have this kind of data in front of them, right? Um, but I mean, the ability to have this real-time data gives you a lot of options too of uh, who you can share it with, right? And you know, you, I think you have some kind of uh, ideas about how you think the the future office uh, might look as far as um, you know signage and kind of uh, transparency goes. Yeah. So, and 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 that's part of the exciting thing. Some of the some of the global uh, tenants uh, that we've been in discussions with. Um, We've talked to them about how, how we come in and, and do space utilization for the purposes of improved cleaning. Um, but th they have other groups within their organization, uh, the property management uh, function, whether that's a regional group or a, a national group uh, that is looking to the, for that same data, that same space utilization data as a way to understand how their space is being used, whether they have more space than they need or the right amount or uh, in, in a world of spatial distancing uh, or social distancing, you know, whether they, they need to have uh, perhaps even a little bit more space than they had before. Um, so depending on what their level of utilization was. So that's one group of people that, that would find use of this kind of data that you know, looks like it has one purpose, but can be used in another. And another group that is finding this very helpful is the uh, employee folks within large uh, tenants that focus on employee engagement. Uh, and they, they need this space uh, utilization data as well. And each of the, the three areas, the building managers, the property, um, the uh, group that's looking at portfolio management and the engagement folks, you, you don't really need to buy three different uh, sort. You don't, you can't, you're not going to put sensors in for those three different groups of people. So you want to be able to leverage that the data that you have available across all three different functions. So that's a, a great example of the way that the data uh, th that's being gathered here, whether it's spatial utilization data or uh, uh, cleaning data, or for example, um, environmental monitoring, we do environmental mon monitoring as well. And so that makes obviously makes a difference in terms of air quality, it makes a difference in terms of comfort. Uh, and knowing which part of the building, uh, you know, some of the newer buildings have, have uh, thermostats that are located throughout the whole office. So you get good readings across the board and you can make adjustments across the board. But some of the build, some of the older buildings don't have that. So being able to place sensors around and see which parts of the building uh, allow you to be in a, a position uh, to realize that it's warmer over here and it's cooler over here, uh, we, we call that kind of being able to d discern whether someone is cold just because their 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 own personal thermostat runs low and they need a sweater versus the person next to them uh, and the temperature being, you know, 72 degrees. That being able to resolve that by being able to say, well, this is what the temperature is here is a helpful kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going back to cleaning, we've actually got a question that's come in that I think is, is pretty interesting about, um, you know, how, how this information can actually be uh, communicated to, to the crews themselves that are cleaning, right? And so is that something that you're seeing done? 
Yeah, so uh, we're, we understand that one of the most important things is, is to be able to make that data available to the cleaning crew. There is kind of a, um, what we call a, a low tech way of doing that. And then there is a more sophisticated way and, and we're working on both of them right now. The, the low tech way of doing that is by doing the monitoring that we're describing and, and then uh, setting thresholds, for example, for space. Uh, so we look at uh, part of the utilization score I was mentioning a few minutes ago, we look at the historical use of a given space. What, how much was that space used over the last particular narrow space? So a restroom, a conference room, a, a, a workspace area. How much was that used over the last 30 days? And then, uh, so the, one of the low tech ways is to say, well, what if, what if there's a surge in use around that space? Let's say 200% or 300%. Then we would like to send a notice or an alert to a staff member to say, you're on a regular uh, cleaning route, but this space just had a surge we'd like you to re, uh, reallocate the way that you're doing your route right now and go visit that space because that needs cleaning right now. Mm -hmm. So th that's where we'd, we'd actually communicate via text, for example, to the uh, staff member and they would go uh, uh, do that cleaning. The, the fuller solution for that uh, that's being explored is where people would actually use, you know, a handheld device and, and there was a picture of that in, in the uh, graphic that we were showing before, where we'd be basically be able to make available, to, this isn't available right now, but it, it's under consideration, where you'd be able to see what your route is that you're covering, and the data would be updating uh, real time. And, and then if there was a surge, then your route would, would automatically kind of be modified to take into account the fact that that uh, surge just took place, and then, and then just like uh, your, you know, like your uh, ways traffic uh, application, then the route would be uh, kind of readjusted accordingly. So those are all all things that are under consideration. They're not products that exist right now, but we know it's possible to do that, and we're looking for ways to. Uh, yeah, I think that brings up a great point of, you know, how dynamic it is to really optimize something like cleaning. Um, you know, it's not even just saying, okay, this room needs to be cleaned. You know, in a big building, you might say, you know, well, okay, this staffer is pretty far away, right? So just to automatically tell them to, you know, go across campus to clean this might not be the, you know, most efficient way where there might be another staffer that's right there, right? And so sure. it's not only what's getting utilized, how it's getting utilized, who it's getting utilized by, but also, you know, where your staff is at any given moment, right? It starts to become a very complicated uh, uh, calculation. Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, we think, like a lot of things, we think things are simple and, and the reality is they're much more complicated. Uh, but having, uh, you know, these are, you can, you, you, there are multiple steps that you can take along the way of this cleaning journey and, and maintaining safe, uh, safe facilities for people. Uh, there are multiple steps along the way. People can start wherever they are and they can graduate, uh, you know, over time to a much more robust capability. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, that, uh, the, the technology provides all kinds of opportunities for people, but at the end of the day, the, the data needs to be integrated into workflow and that workflow is people's lives and their work process. So how do you how do you do that and work with people in a way that allows them to do to feel good about the work they do uh, to do a very good job by spending their time focusing on on the areas that where where their contribution matters and, and not where it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. so, you know, we talked to, about scenario modeling earlier, and I guess, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, kind of go through the worst case scenario. Right. Which is you have an outbreak associated with the building. Yeah. You know, talk to me a little bit about how this kind of technology can help, you know, with contact tracing and really, you know, the aftermath of if, if you find out that there was an outbreak. Sure. Well, the, um, the, the contact tracing, we have an application that, uh, that we ut utilize for contact tracing. We work with companies around the globe to do that. 
the the, the technology piece of it is um, is interesting. Um, it bas basically people will wear a bracelet, a Bluetooth bracelet. Uh, so if you and I were in a space and we were in that space within six feet of each other for a period of ten minutes or more, uh, our each of our bracelets would would uh, acknowledge or get a we that is labeled a, an event. In addition to those bracelets, there are also um, Bluetooth location beacons in, in particular spaces. So now we know that we had an event and we know where that event occurred. So uh, our, uh, our platform receives the signal from those uh, Bluetooth beacons through a gateway uh, that translates Bluetooth into this standard communication protocol I mentioned before, and then sends that up to the cloud and we make that information then available to our clients. Our, our clients receive that information. Uh, they have uh, an application. The data that we collect, and this is very important, the data we collect has no PII in it. So we don't, we can't, we don't know that Franco and Tom were the bracelets that had that information. We, that information gets connected at the back end at the company level where they can then associate uh, the two of us with that individual bracelet. So they can then, uh, let's say that uh, I, I test positive for COVID. I report that to the company. Now the, the company has the ability to go back and look at the last two weeks of activity. They can see how many events occurred between me and other people where those events occurred, and they can do the contact tracing uh, by reaching out because now they know who it is that uh, I was in contact with. They can reach them directly, and those people can quarantine appropriately. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, because they know what what space where that took place in in uh, in in a building, say in a, in a large factory or in an office. Uh, they can go back and do some uh, extra cleaning there or deep cleaning as required. So, so that contact tracing solution allows for, in, in, a, uh, in, in a very specific kind of way, to, to accomplish uh, at least an important part of the exercise that manual contact tracers do, where they have to, they have to reach out and, and find, you know, if I tell them that I was in touch with you and three or four other people, they then have to reach out to them. We now know how many of those events they were there were, how long those events lasted, etc. It becomes uh, data that can be used in a in a very action oriented way. Great. Well, we have a couple questions, and I'd like to get to them with our remaining time. Um, some of them are a little more general, and some are quite specific. Uh, I want to start with a specific one here. Um, someone asked about this uh, kind of instantaneous communication with the cleaning crew. Uh, They're interested in, um, you know, basically, you know, how, how many different softwares would they need to be able to, to optimize this and, and how do you integrate those? Um, so, so, you know, that's one of the, one of the dangers about talking with people about what's available today and what is in the works. So, um, uh, and there, you know, there are low tech ways and higher, higher tech ways of doing this. Um, the, it really depends on the existing infrastructure uh, that uh, the organization has. Uh, in some cases, organizations have uh, work, work management systems where they can communicate to their staff and their staff may have walkie talkies, they may have uh, mobile devices. On the mobile devices, they may be able to receive texts. So. Uh, other other organizations don't don't have work order management systems, uh, and they don't have uh, predetermined schedules uh, that that people are using to follow their route. So it really depends a lot on what kind of infrastructure exists. The low tech way of doing it is basically to where where we're monitoring what's going on in the spaces, and then we are able to reach out to people by notification. And, and that can be via text. Uh, and, uh, and then they can do that kind of ad hoc uh, surge related cleaning. Uh, the fuller implementation isn't available right now. 
but that that's where you would have a handheld uh, application uh, that is a, a cleaning application that would be available by the uh, uh, it, by the, the where the uh, custodian would have that on uh, with them, and and then we'd be able to communicate directly through that to them uh, based on the frequent updates from uh, from the sensors. So for most people. I'd say that's not something that you're going to be able to do right now because that application, we, we have partners that we uh, we may be able to make that available through, uh, but that's really a, a futures kind of thing. But if you want to be able to, to do something sooner rather than later, uh, we'd have to take a look at the existing infrastructure that they have and figure out how to do that. Yeah, and again, it goes back to how, you know, bespoke every building is managed, right? And so it's really hard to kind of, have a one one size fits all because it, you know they're so different like you say some buildings don't even have schedules right it's a, it is a little bit more of kind of a free safety uh, uh situation um okay i want to get to another question and this is one that's come up a couple times and um you know I, I think it's valid and you know people kind of saying well this sounds great but let's let's say that we do get a vaccine right let's say that covid is in our rearview mirror and we're back to normal you know, will, will this still be a valid investment and, and what can be done with it, you know, when we go back to whatever normal looks like after this? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Um, the, um, I, I, I mentioned earlier that generally speaking uh, for many buildings, uh, those buildings pre-COVID were, were only occupied, uh, you know, 60 or 65% of the time. So, but people had not really adjusted their cleaning staffing levels uh, based on that kind of oc occupancy. Historically, if we go back three, four or five years, 10 years, that, that level of occupancy was much higher. It was much higher because the mobile tools that we have now and, uh, and what's possible to do from working at, at home pre-COVID was much greater. So occupancy levels have really declined over the last uh, five to 10 years and have reached pre-COVID, had reached that, that level. The cleaning schedules hadn't adjusted based on that lower level of occupancy. So our pre-COVID conversation with uh, prospects was you have excess, in most cases, you have excess capacity uh, unless you're a really high growth company that is bumping right up against uh, against your, uh, your capacity levels. And in that case, you're cleaning all of those spaces appropriately. So, uh, so by being, uh, so the answer to the question is absolutely. Uh, occupancy will, is not at 65%, it's closer to 20% now. But when we return back to whatever the new normal is, we're not gonna be looking at occupancy levels that are at 90 or 85%. It's gonna be lower. There's gonna be, it's likely there will be more distributed facilities that uh, employees can go to. So, you know, the, the, the large campus may be broken up into pieces and, and there will be uh, regional offices and city offices where people can go and get together to to collaborate in ways that are necessary to make the business run. Um, but, but generally speaking, this kind of technology will allow you to be flexible and adaptable in, in the future environment. And uh, be, because there is excess capacity, you will, you will be in a position to be able to use this in a way that allows you to do a much better job allocating the right level of resource, cleaning resources and other resources to the way that you use your building. Yeah, and I have to think that, you know, even if uh, we snapped our fingers and everything went away today, there is likely going to be an economic uh, repercussion of this, right? And so if we see higher vacancy, you know, we see, um, you know, work from home will obviously probably be a lot more prevalent now as people have kind of, it's, you know, kind of proven itself in a lot of cases. So I think as vacancies drop, uh, it will become even more important to kind of skim that last, you know, 35%. Like you said, if most buildings are already 65%, you know, only utilized their cleaning, then I think uh, an investment now will probably pay dividends, you know, for, for quite a while in the future. Yep. 
Well, great. Well, we're hitting the top of the hour. I think we've covered a lot of really great things here. I just want to uh, you know, thank everybody again for joining us. I know everybody's busy and uh, there's a lot of great uh, webinars out there. So I really hope that this uh, helped you. Um, my lines of communication are always open. If you want to uh, send me a follow-up uh, email, I'm happy to uh, relay that to, to Tom here. And um, yeah, you can uh, definitely uh, always reach me at franco at propmoto.com. Please uh, go to our website, sign up for our email, and uh, check out all the other webinars that, that we have. Yeah, we'd like to have people ha have access to us as well, uh, Franco. They, they can reach uh, us at microshare.io. Uh, or tjackson at microshare.io. Uh, yeah, we will, uh, we will have a, a, a recording of this available. Um, we will also have transcripts if anybody wants them. And, and again, we'll, uh, we'll, we're happy to, to share any of the information uh, going forward about uh, how to reach Microshare and how to hopefully, you know, really be a lot smarter with the way that we plan our cleaning schedules. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you.